Hello and welcome to the last presentation for IB History, the Cold War. Today we're going to be covering the end of the Cold War. This presentation explores the costs and failure of Soviet policies and the eventual collapse of the USSR. It also reviews the decline of the Soviet and Comic-Con economies and the impact of Gorbachev's policies of Glasnost and Perestroika. To begin with, we're going to be talking about the new Cold War from 1976 to 1985. Our getting question is, how was the USSR weakened by the new Cold War from these dates? Please take a screenshot of this slide so that you know how this section of the presentation is structured. A new period of competition between the Soviet and Western blocs began in 1976. This included a re renewed arms race, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and various crises in Eastern Europe. The first blow to the Helsinki spirit occurred when the Soviet Union pla placed SS-20 medium-range nuclear missiles in Central Europe in 1976. These weapons could reach targets between 600 and 5,000 kilometers away, threatening all NATO states in Europe. If no agreement was reached, the U.S. would deploy 552 Pershing and other nuclear-equipped missiles in Europe by 1983. This agreement, however, was difficult to reach as the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. Despite continued protest, however, the U.S. supplied missiles were, inst uh, were installed between 1983 and 1987 in the FRG, Britain, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Italy, eliminating any Soviet strate strategic advantage. Obviously, key for this time period is going to be the, the invasion of Afghanistan. In 1979, it fi finally ended U.S.-Soviet Detente because it was actually an outright uh, move against the U.S. in the Middle East. This is a map of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, obviously, we see the Soviet side, also how refugees were actually moved. We have 2.9 million refugees moving away from the major cities. We have some zones of main combat and some in, uh, initial um, initial centers of resistance. So obviously it's going to be going all the way through Afghanistan and we're going to have both um, the USSR and the US intervening. In 1973, Afghan Prime Minister Mohammed Daoud Khan seized power from his cousin King Zahir Shah. Afghanistan had remained a non-aligned state, but the USSR enjoyed greater influence there. Daoud attempted to modernize both the economy and society, but met with opposition from traditional conservative Afghan leaders, including the Muslim religious authorities. He wished to develop agriculture, build modern roads, and establish a strong centralized state. At the same time, Daoud was criticized by Afghan communists for not modernizing the country more rapidly. In 1978, Daoud's government was overthrown by the Afghan Communist Party, which was composed of two rival groups, the Parcham and the Kalk. The communists embarked on a radical new reform program accompanied by widespread repression, which provoked opposition from conservative Muslims in the countryside. Their attempts to modernize agriculture by seizing land from the peasantry was deeply unpopular. These are the reasons for Soviet intervention. By November 1979, the USSR came to the conclusion that in, if the communist regime was to survive in Afghanistan, the unpopular president Hafiz Sula Amin of the Kalk faction of the Communist Party would have to be removed. So we're move, removing the leadership of the Communist Party to have a better leadership so that the USSR can maintain control. So the USSR also wanted to prevent Afghanistan falling under the control of a conservative Islamic government. It believed that an Islamic-controlled Afghanistan, together with the Islamic regime already established in Iran in 1979, threatened to spread Islamic militancy to the Soviet Union's Central Asian Republic. So obviously the, the taking over of Afghanistan is going to be strategic to actually spread communism across the Middle East. We're going to have some Soviet military, military oper operations. Between 24 and 20, uh, the 27th of December 1979, 
Around 50,000 Soviet troops were flown into Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan. There, uh, there, there were around uh, uh, 100,000 Soviet troops stationed in the country within months. So it's a lot of troops occupying the country. On the 27th of, the, of December, Soviet so soldiers attacked the pre uh, presidential palace, executed Amin, and replaced him with his parchment rival, Babrak Kamal. The Soviets aimed to crush the Muslim fundamentalist rebels and stabilize the government so that they could rapidly withdraw. Soviet forces were able to occupy Kabul and all the other major cities, but they encountered two major military pro uh, problems. The Afghan army disintegrated, leaving Soviet forces to conduct all military actions and secure the country. Babrak Kamal did not have the support of the Afghan people who felt that he worked for the foreign Soviets, not Afghans, leading them to support Muslim fundamentalist guerrilla fighters known as the Mujahedin. Uh, we see a picture of them here. Uh, they wished to establish an Islamic government for the country. And so we're going to see the rise of guerrilla groups um, that are going to be t trying to counter Soviet intervention in the country. Faced by up to 2,100 uh, Mujahedin guerrillas, the Soviet military controlled only one-fifth of the country. By 1985, it was clear that the war could not be won by the Soviets as they faced seven different Mujahedin factions who had headquarters in mountainous areas along the border with Pakistan. Here's a picture of the resistance fighters posing for a photo. Uh, this is one of the guerrilla groups. There's obviously going to be a U.S. reaction from 1979 to 1987. There's a huge U.S. intervention in Afghanistan. The U.S. government believed the invasion, of, the invasion of Afghanistan was a new and highly threatening development in Soviet foreign policy. They mostly feared losing access to the oil supply in the region. President Jimmy Carter responded by banning grain exports to the USSR and the U.S. Senate, refused to ratify the SALT II Treaty. The U.S. also boycotted the 1980 Olympic Games that were held in Moscow. More importantly, the U.S. financed the supply of weapons to Afghan Mujahedin guerrillas with money distributed through agencies and in neighboring Pakistan. In 1986, U.S. President Ronald Reagan decided to send the Mujahedin new lightweight ground-to-air missiles, rapidly diminishing Soviet air, air superiority and allowing the guerrillas to ben uh, the benefit of U.S. satellite and communication information. So the U.S. is going to be siding with the guerrillas to get the Soviets out as soon as possible. Obviously, the 1980 Moscow Olympics are going to be a huge uh, historical event during this time period. In 1980, the United States led a boycott of the Summer Olympic Games in Moscow to, prote to protest the late 1979 Soviet inv invasion of Afghanistan. In total, 65 nations refused to participate in the Games, whereas 80 countries sent athletes to compete. So we have a really, really low um, turnout for the Olympics that year. The People's Republic of China denounced the invasion of Afghanistan, canceled the Sino-Soviet talks, which were due to start in 1980, and increased the supply of farms to the guerrillas in the country. The PRC approved the export of 400 items of advanced military technology for the guerrillas as well. Western Europe is also going to respond. The FRG, France, Britain, and the other Western European states condemned the invasion of Afghanistan at the United Nations, but were unwilling to let it destroy the detente that Ostpolitik had created in Europe. I remind you that Ostpolitik is this measures to unite Germany again. We're now moving on to Poland, and we're going to be talking about the Solidarity Movement in Poland from 1980 to 1982. Apart from the USSR, Poland was military the most important country in the Soviet bloc because it was the geographical link between the Soviet Union and the GDR, through which any attack on the West or from it would occur. It provided one-third of all Eastern European armed forces in the Warsaw Pact, and Poland was also be, uh, was also important because it had the largest population of any Soviet bloc state other than the USSR and was heavily industrialized, making it, making it a really, really important economic hub.
We're also going to be seeing the Baltic crisis of 1970 and 1971. This is uh, a key crisis that is going to be leading to the independence of the states later on. By 1970, the government had decided to encourage better farming practices and more food production by increasing the price of food so that farmers would gain more profits. A 30% rise in food prices was announced in 1970, leading to strikes. The Soviet government recommended the replacement of Gomulka by Edward Gherkin. Uh, peace was restored by freezing food prices at their former levels. So we are seeing an economic crisis. We're seeing uh, a government that wants to become Polish, not, not led by the USSR. And so we're in June 1976, we're going to be seeing the rise of some riots. Over the next five years, Gierek attempted to make the Polish economy more competitive. He borrowed large sums from Western Europe to pay for, for imported Western technology. By 1975, however, it was clear that Poland was becoming ever more indebted. Once again, the government responded by increasing food prices in June 1970, this time by 60%. So we now have a 90% increase in food prices. This, the riots also led to the formation of the Workers' Defense Committee. Again, I'm going to repeat it. It's a formation of the Workers' Defense Committee, which is a body created to give aid to those arrested by communist authorities and also to help their families. So we're seeing the buildup of this total political opposition to the USSR in Poland. In 1975, Gerek attempted to reform the constitution to give the central ministries more effective power over Poland's provinces and also to confirm the leading role of the Polish United Workers' Party or the PUWP. This was seen by many Poles as an effort to tighten the grip of the party on Poland and led to a new wave of opposition to the government. Exploiting Basket 3 of the Helsinki Final Act, groups dedicated to the defense of human rights were established. Around 20 underground newspapers and periodicals were secretly published and circulated to communicate ideas and information outside of government channels. In May 1979, the newly installed Roman Catholic Pope John Paul II, who was from Poland, visited his home country. Huge crowds greeted him and his popularity in, a, in the face of a theoretically atheist government which demonstrated further disconnection, disconnection between Poland citizens and the USSR government in Poland, obviously. So we're going to be seeing the emergence of solidar Solidarity or Solid Solidarność. By the mid-1980, Poland faced a major economic crisis. The constant rise of oil inflated prices and an economic recession in the West meant that Poland had no market for its exports. In August 1980, strikes erupted throughout the country when the government once again, without any previous warning, announced major increases in the price of food. In Gnest, a city in Poland, 20,000 workers under the leadership of, of the trade union activist Lech Wale uh, was barricaded, barricaded themselves in the Lenin shipyards. They also conceded on an agreement if all the other strikes were addressed. It was this action that which gave birth to Solidarity, or the Solidarity Movement, which challenged the monopoly of power enjoyed by the PUWP. On August 31st, the NAST agreement was signed between Solidarity and the government. Solidarity was recognized as an independent and self-governing trade union. The right to strike, freedom of speech, and access to media were guaranteed, and solidarity was recognized uh, as, a, as a leading role of the PUWP. This gave rise to the threat of Soviet intervention in December 1980. Brezhnev and other Warsaw Pact leaders urged the new Polish Prime Minister, Stanislaw Kania, who, was replaced by, who had replaced Gierek to crush the anti-socialist opposition forces. The first thing that he's going to be doing is that throughout 1981, Poland's economy remained in crisis and rationing began. Negotiations between P, the PUWP, Solidarity, and the Catholic Church to form a three-sided council of national reconciliation failed. The threat of Soviet intervention again arose, but in December, Brezhnev agreed to a declaration of martial law by General Jarusz Selsky, 
again, General Jaruselski, Kania's successor. So we're seeing multiple prime ministers taking over the country during this time period over the course of three, four years. And this is going to be leading to the arrest of Solidarity's leadership, the use of soldiers to end strikes, Poland's army ruling the state, and the outlawing, the outlawing of Solidarity in October 1982. So again, we're seeing a, a huge counter, huge countermeasures against solidarity because that solidarity symbolizes the independence of Poland and the USSR wants to intervene, obviously. There's going to be multiple uh, years of tension between 1981 and 1984. In January 1981, Ronald, Ronald Reagan became the US president. Between 1981 and 1983, he adopted an uncompromising line towards the USSR. This approach included hostile speeches about the USSR and communism, a massive increase in US armament that absorbed 30% of all government spending between 1981 and 85, the rejection of the South II Treaty, because obviously Congress also rejected the treaty and did not, uh, did not ratify it, the deployment of missiles in Western Europe, and support for the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. In November 1982, Brezhnev died and was replaced by Yuri Andropov. In 1983, Reagan announced a Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, also commonly called Star Wars, which was meant to be an anti-ballistic wow. missile shield composed of nuclear missiles and laser-armed satellites that would protect the U.S. from attack. The ramifications of this, of, of this um, policy was tremendous, uh, and threatened potentially to end the balance of power between the two superpowers in favor of the U.S. Now we're not going to have a bipolar international state of affairs. We're not going to have a unipolar state of affairs in favor of the U.S. On September 1st, 1983... Tension between the U.S. and the USSR was further increased when a Soviet fighter aircraft destroyed a South Korean passenger aircraft, killing around 269 people on board. This included 61 U.S. citizens, the U.S. was enraged, and the USSR claimed no responsibility. We do see a trend in reduced tensions after 1984. So at the end of 1983, Reagan and his advisors came to the conclusion that relations with the USSR needed to be improved. The Soviet response to Reagan's diplomatic initiatives was delayed by the death of Andropov in February 1984. His successor, Konstantin Chernenko, who we see in the site, was a cautious and er elderly Soviet politician, but did agree to reopen arms negotiations for the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or no, also known as START. The renewed negotiations began in March 1985, the month that Chernenko died and was replaced by Mikhail, Mikhail Gorbachev. And so we see multiple prime ministers taking over, and at the end of the day, Gorbachev is going to have to intervene and uh, renewing the Tente. This is what we're going to be seeing in the second section of this presentation, Mikhail Gorbachev and the renewed Tente from 1985 to 1989. The guiding question is, why did Gorbachev improve relations between the U.S. and the PRC? When Gorbachev became General Secretary of the Communist Party, he appeared a youthful and dynamic leader in contrast to his el elderly ill predecessors. His great aim was to modernize the USSR, and two key terms, glasnost and perestroika, set the tone for his reforms. Please take a screenshot of this slide because this is how this section of the presentation is structured. Glasnost refers to openness regarding the USSR economic and political systems, including public discussion and debate. Perestroika, on the other hand, means transformation or restructuring of the Communist Party to make it more responsive to the needs of the people. Gorbachev realized that the ultimate survival of the USSR depended on ending the Cold War and reforming the economy. He inherited a very difficult situation. The collapse of the Tente in the late 1970s between the US and the USSR led to a new and expensive arms race, which the USSR could not financially afford. The war in Afghanistan drained resources and had little chance of success. 
and the Soviet economy was hampered by inefficiency, corruption, and a lack of technology. The USSR has multiple economic weaknesses. It was the economic weaknesses of both the USSR and Comic-Con that was a key factor in the collapse of communism and the disintegration of the USSR by 1991. Rapid industrialization and growth had happened in the 1960s, but the Soviet command economy had become very bureaucratic and inflexible. The system functioned well when it concentrated on a particular target, such as war production or post-Second World War recovery, but it was poor at adapting and supplying at competitive prices the multitude of consumer goods which were available to capitalist states. In the early 1960s, Soviet economic Liverman and Sikin from Czechoslovakia put forward ideas for decentralizing the economy to allow decisions of production, design and prices to be taken by local factory managers. In Czechoslovakia, these ideas began to be realized in 1965 and, 19, and 1968. Greater freedoms was given to the factory managers. Business taxes were reduced to encourage production. Wage differentiation between skilled and unskilled workers was introduced and wholesale prices were determined by the market. The economy needs to change in the USSR at this point. The 1970s were a period of great economic change and crisis for capitalist economies in the, in the Western Bloc. After the October War in 1973, oil prices were quadrupled by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. In just a few months, in protest against the West, West support of Israel. This weakened the Western economic, economies and fueled inflation. The West responded to this challenge by modernizing and adapting their economies to take advantage of, new, of developing new in industries and technologies. Hence, we see a rise in neocolonialism, because OPEC is very closed up and they're actually working against the West, and obviously Israel remains as a part of the West in this case then uh, the, the U.S. and the rest of the Western allies need to actually work towards another system that is going to be benefiting them. Hence their intervention in Latin America and Africa as neocolonial powers. In 1985, sorry, in 1980 to 1985, uh, Comic-Con states negotiated lo loans with the West on the assumptions that this money would enable them to modernize their economies. By 1980, it was increasingly clear that the USSR and Eastern Europe had failed to develop the new industries based on information technology. They had amassed a huge debt and had to be paid back with an interest at the end of 10 years to Western European and US banks. At the same time, oil prices on the international market fell from $35 to $16 a barrel, resulting in a disastrous decline in the income of the Soviet Union. Pretty much every single Eastern European country is seeking out the aid of NATO, it's seeking out the aid of other European states in order to break free of the economic constraints of the Soviet Union. The tent is going to be renegotiated in 1985. Gorbachev was determined to end the Cold War as it was too costly and prevented the implementation of Perestroika and Glasnost. He aimed to reform the Soviet economy fundamentally and liberalize its political system. He worked towards achieving international cooperation and a real coexistence between the two hitherto rival systems, whose values and principles would in time converge rather than conflict. The leaders saw these policies as an improvement for the Marxist-Leninist system. In April 1985, Gorbachev halted the installation of further SS-20 missiles in uh, Eastern Europe and in October began to reduce the total number deployed. He failed at the Reykjavik summit in Iceland in 1986 to persuade President Reagan to stop the SDI development in return for the negotiation of armed control treaties. However, such was his wish to end the arms race that he accepted unconditionally a NATO plan for a total withdrawal of medium-range missiles by both sides in Europe at the Washington summit in December 1987. We're seeing a total disarmament of both sides. In terms of human rights, this becomes uh, very, very problematic for uh, people in Eastern Europe mostly. Gorbachev informed his diplomats at the meeting at the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs 
that the USSR would now consider Basket 3 of the Helsinki Accords on Human Rights as important. This declaration led to prominent Soviet dissent, Andrei Sakharov being allowed to return to Moscow from exile in the city of Gorky in December 1986, the, rele the release of dissidents from prison in 1987 and 1988, Soviet Jews being allowed to emigrate to Israel more easily, foreign government media such as the US's Voice of America and Britain's BBC, foreign service radio transmitted news being permitted to broadcast freely within the USSR, and intellectual freedom in, the, in Russia was now experienced. We see a total opening of the media in the USSR and a total uh, transformation, radical transformation in terms of glasnost here. We see the tenta expanding globally as well. During the 1980s, there were four main areas of proxy conflict where the US and the USSR supported opposing sites. Afghanistan, Cambodia, Nicaragua, and Angola. In Afghanistan, Gorbachev realized that the Soviet policy had failed, and in November 1986 decided that Soviet troops, regardless of the consequences within Afghanistan, would have to be withdrawn as soon as possible. The Soviets replaced Afghanistan President Babrak Karmal with Mohammed Najibullah, who they believed would be able to form a government of national unity that could negotiate a peace between the various factions fighting in Afghanistan. In, 19, in April 1988, agreements were signed in Geneva, Switzerland, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. This is called the Afghan-Pakistani Treaty. With the USSR and Soviet, the, the with the USSR and the US as sponsors, this consisted of, on a bilateral agreement between Pakistan and Afghanistan that neither state would interfere in the internal affairs of the other. Neither state would allow militant groups hostile to the other state to train within their country and Afghan refugees in Pakistan would be permitted to return to Afghanistan. The withdrawal of Soviet troops from Afghanistan would begin on May 15, 1988, and end by 1989. However, Mujahideen guerrillas, who were not represented at Geneva, fought on. In Cambodia, uh, basically we still have issues with Vietnam. In 1979, Vietnam, supported by the USSR, invaded Cambodia and overthrew the Khmer Rouge regime, establishing the pro-Vietnam People's Republic of Kampuchea, or PRK. Vietnamese military units remained in Cambodia to support the new republic. The UN, however, still recognized the Khmer Rouge regime as a legitimate government of the country. Gorbachev was ready to collaborate with both the US and, and the PRC to find a solution to the Cambodian problem and pressure the Vietnamese to withdraw from the country. This is, does not lead to immediate peace, but a ceasefire between the PRK and rebels was negotiated in 1991 by the UN Security Council with active US and USSR assistance. In July 1979, the Marxist-leaning uh, Sandista political party came to power in Nicaragua. After the overthrow of the country's U.S. back, uh, back leader Anastasio Samosa de Baile and supported rebel activity in nearby El Salvador. In 1981, Sandinista's leaders visited the USSR and succeeded in per persuading the Soviets to send military equipment to Nicaragua. In response, U.S. troops invaded the island state of Granada in the Caribbean Sea in October 1983, overthrowing a communist regime established there in 1979, and launched a co covert war against the Sandinista government of Nicaragua. President Reagan government equipped and supplied anti-Sandinista rebels, collectively referred to as the Contras, despite the U.S. Senate's decision to prohibit the funding of this. In 1988, both the U.S. and the USSR supported a plan drawn up by the Central American states that ended foreign assistance to all fighting groups and called for free elections to resolve the Nicaraguan Civil War. In Angola and Namibia, we're going to be seeing increased fighting again between the factions involved. In 1987, Fighting increased in Angola between the Movement for the Liberation of Angola, the MPLA, and the South African-backed UNITA MPLA's uh, UNITA. Um, the MPLA's defeat was swiftly followed by the advance of South African troops into the country, but this was halted by intervention of Cuban air power. 
Both the U.S. and the USSR pressured Cuba, Angola, and South Africa to agree to a ceasefire and the withdrawal of Cuban troops. In December 1988, South Africa agreed to implement UN Resolution 435, which called for the independence of Namibia. In Ethiopia, Gorbachev continued to send financial aid to assist Mengistu regime until 1989. In early 1990, due to the financial crisis triggered by the collapse in the prices of its coffee exports, Mengistu turned to the U.S. for financial aid. But in May 1990, 1991, he was ousted in a coup led by his anti-Marxist opponents. Chinese and Soviet relations are, are still going to occur at this time. So between 1976 and 1989, after Mao's death on September 1976, the Ganga Four, headed by Mao's widow, was soon removed from power. Then Xiaoping, with the support of the army and the majority of the Chinese Communist Party officials, emerged as the uh, People's Republic of China's new leader in 1978. He is a key figure here, so please write down his name, Deng Xiaoping. Deng abandoned Mao's policies of class struggle and continuous revolution. He aimed to improve the, the economy and thereby strengthen the Chinese Communist Party, which would benefit from the country's prosperity and rising standards of living. To accomplish this, he encouraged the adaptation of capitalist methods of production and allowed the market to determine which products were produced and to set prices. The Chinese Communist Party would maintain control of the economy nevertheless. We still see the Chinese Communist Party being in control of China. U.S. Chinese cooperation is also going to be increasing. Deng's new economic reforms of the late 1970s occurred at the same time as Soviet-U.S. relations began to deteriorate after the Helsinki Conference. On January 1979, the PRC and the U.S. announced the restoration of formal re diplomatic relations. We're also going to be seeing the end of the PRC-Soviet dispute, Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan and Vietnamese troops from Cambodia, coupled with a reduction of Soviet troops along the PRC-Soviet frontier, cleared the way for improving relations between, the, between China and the USSR. In May 1989, after a summit meeting in Beijing between Gorbachev and the PRC leadership, relations were fully restored. Gorbachev's visit to Beijing in 1989 was overshadowed by China's own political crisis. Glasnost and Perestroika in the USSR had inspired Chinese students and intellectuals who wanted political reform in addition to economic wants. On his arrival at Beijing, Gorbachev was greeted by hundreds of thousands of students. The day after Gorbachev left Beijing, the PRC government declared martial law and forcibly cleared the demonstrators from Tiananmen Square with many killed. In essence, all reforms were, would be imposed by the leaders and not result from popular movements or demonstrations. In this slide, we see how the tanks are actually going and uh, pushing through a, a protester, and the protester is basically standing in front of all these different, all, all these tanks in protest against the political, um, the political regime of the Communist Party. The third section of this presentation is the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe from 1989 to 1990. The guiding question is, why did communism collapse in Eastern and Southeastern Europe? Please take a screenshot of this slide because this is how this section of the presentation is structured. By withdrawing from Afghanistan and Africa, Gorbachev refocused Soviet policy on Europe. He hoped to safeguard Soviet security in Europe through a policy of political cooperation and negotiation rather than force. By 1989, Gorbachev encouraged communist Eastern European states to reform economically and to liberalize politically. Eastern and Southeastern Europe was divided into three loose groups. In Poland, Hungary, and Bulgaria, governments were ready to contemplate at least limited political and economic reform as long as communists remained in overall control. 
In the GDR, Czechoslovakia, Romania, and Albania, governments were unwilling to experiment with political or economic reform and were compelled to reform by the dramatic events occurring in the GDR. Yugoslavia, even before the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, was facing major challenges with nationalism, which would ultimately tear it apart. We're going to be seeing the Balkan wars unfold in the 1990s uh, because of all these ethnic tensions within Yugoslavia. The political changes in Poland, Hungary, and Bulgaria have been described as negotiated revolutions. What is meant by this is that the revolutionary changes that occurred in these countries were introduced with the support of the ruling communists. With Poland's economy increasingly indebted, the ruling leader, General Jaruzlik Leski, was forced once again to introduce price rises up to 200% in 1988. This, coupled with other issues such as endemic corruption throughout the government and the, and the industries it controlled, led to a series of strikes throughout the nation, forcing the government to legalize solidarity again and enter into negotiations with this group. This is going to be leading to the Roundtable Agreements of 1989. They were signed between the, the three groups. Solidarity was recognized not just as a trade union, but also as a political party. A new constitution was also created. This allowed Solidarity to, complete, to compete for 35% of seats in the lower house of parliament. The SEG with 65% reserved for communists. And the upper house of the SEG would be elected in free elections and both houses would elect the president of Poland. In the first round of the elections on June 4th, Solidarity won 92 out of the 100 seats in the Shem's upper house and 160 of the 161 seats in the lower house, for which they were allowed to compete. Two weeks later, communists won all the seats reserved for them, but only 25% of eligible voters voted. It was decided that Solidarity would form the government and that the communists would hold a minority of ministerial positions. On August 18th, Solidarity led a coalition government that contained only four communists. Solidarity, however, declared that Poland would remain a member of the Warsaw Pact. Communists still controlled the ministries of defense, interior, transportation, foreign trade, which were one of the, I mean, these are the main ministries of the country. The end of the Cold War in Poland has come. Only with the collapse of the communist rule in the GDR and Czechoslovakia did Solidarity remove communists from control of the army and the police. Lech Wale of Solidarity was elected president in 1990. In Hungary, from the 1960s onwards, Hungary's leader, Janos Kadar, pursued a policy tolerant of criticism as long as the legitimacy of the communist regime was not undermined, and liberalized the economy a little bit. The USSR tolerated this as Kadar remained loyal to the Warsaw Pact. In, 1990, in 1988, responding to the atmosphere created by Gorbachev's perestroika and glasnost, the Hungarian Socialist Worker Party, MSZMP, replaced Kadar with Karoli Gross, a committed reformer. The country would become a multi-party democracy to prevent revolution. Roundtable talks began between the government and the opposition groups, ending in agreement that free parliamentary elections were to be held in March and April 1990. The party leaders accepted this because they were convinced that having seized the, initi the initiative to reform, the Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party would emerge as the dominant force. It only won 11% of the vote and could not take part in the government. By 1989, the ruling Bulgarian Communist Party had been led by Todor Sivkov for 35 years. Sivkov had made many enemies in the party through his radical administrative reforms which had led to the termination of the careers of around 30,000 government officials. His family was part of the government as well, those whom Sikov favored in the party were allowed to shop in special stores with stocked imported Western goods, have access to the best education, receive up to 500% more salary than other officials, and so forth. Cryonism was one of the main features of his rule. His program of Bulgarianization led to the expulsion of around 2 million ethnic Turks from the country. 
the Bulgarian foreign minister Petar Mladenov confidentially informed Gorbachev in July 1989 that he intended to carry out a change of direction in Bulgaria, which Gorbachev did not oppose. Mladenov gained the backing of the Deputy Prime Minister and Ministry of, Ministry of Defense and on November 9th forced Sikov to resign. The Bulgarian Communist Party transformed itself into a socialist party and was successful in winning the elections with a majority of 52.75%. In 1999, when elections based on the new constitution took place, it was defeated. In Eastern Europe, in the 1970s, Diplomatic uh, recognition by the West gave the country international legitimacy, which it had hitherto lacked. The people of the GDR had no choice but to comply with the Soviets, especially behind the wall. In March 1978, the regime was further strengthened when Protestant churches recognized that they had to work within a socialist society and in return received a degree of toleration from the government. Ospolitik and the implications for human rights in the Helsinki Accords increased popular demands for closer contact with the FRG and a more liberal regime. In 1986, short visits to the FRG to see friends and their relatives were made possible, provided a return to the GDR was guaranteed. Visits proved increasingly popular, but at the same time, the conditions attached to them emphasized the lack of freedom for Eastern German citizens. It was to be the issue of the right to free travel and emigration to the FRG that brought about the terminal crisis of the GDR. On May 1989, Hungary began to dismantle the barriers along its frontier with Austria, a neutral state. Hungary did not originally intend to allow citizens from other Warsaw Pact states to travel through it to Austria, but in July, thousands of East Germans who were allowed to visit Warsaw Pact country without permits traveled to Hungary, hoping to cross into Austria. Austrians agreed to accept those East Germans in Hungary, and within three days, 18,000 people came across the border from East Germany into Hungary, into Austria. In the meantime, more GDR citizens besieged the FRG embassy in Prague, Czechoslovakia. Around 3,500 people were encamped in the embassy. The Czechoslovak government was not prepared to open its borders with the FRG, but also refused to use force against the East Germans. Unwilling to force a confrontation on the eve of the celebration of the 40th anniversary of the founding of the GDR, Honecker, the leader, granted those GDR citizens in Czechoslovakia exit visas to the West, but insisted that they would have to travel back to the GDR to the FRG in locked trains after which Czechoslovak GDR frontier would be closed. Once the uh, route the trains were taking to the West German frontier became known, large crowds demonstrated along the routes. At Dresden Station, on October 7th, a crowd of 10,000 attempted to storm the station and board the trains to the FRG. On four successive Mondays between the, the September 25th and October 16th, large but peaceful demonstrations took place in Liepzing in the GDR. The regime did not respond with violence. This nonviolent approach was, by the government was a result of disciplined, nonviolent demonstrators, a deeply divided Politburo that was unsure of, the, of what approach was needed and of the loyalty of its policemen and the factory militias, knowledge that no help could be accept, expected from the Soviet Union to reinforce the government's authority, and the statement by Gorbachev during a visit to East Berlin on October 7, when he indicated that reforms were needed by stating life punishes uh, to latecomers. The Berlin Wall is finally going to be open. In the absence of any effective restraints by the police or the army, crowds of demonstrators continue to grow in the cities. On November 4th, half a million congregated in East Berlin to demand further reform and the right to travel abroad. Only five days later, a concession was made which granted all GDR citizens with passports the right to an exit visa valid for any border crossing, including entry into West Berlin. Initially, this was supposed to take effect from the morning of November 10th, but it was announced prematurely in a press conference on the evening of, of the 9th. And that night, border guards facing a crowd of around 20,000 people 
Open up the crossing points through the wall and into West Berlin. The wall has fallen. The opening of the Berlin Wall had immediate consequences for Czechoslovakia and Romania in 1989. In Czechoslovakia, uh, it was still co uh, controlled by those who had called for the suppression of the Prague Spring. However, changes in Poland and Hungary in the summer of 1989 did impact on the situation in Czechoslovakia. Prime Minister Ladislav Adamek announced economic reforms which were similar to those introduced during the Prague Spring, but they were accompanied by political reforms. The number of opposition groups increased to nearly 40. On August 21st, 1989, the 21st anniversary of the Prague Spring, 10,000 demonstrators chanted slogans such as Long Live Poland and Long Live Dubček. This triggered a series of events known as the Velvet Revolution, on November 19th, 12 opposition groups formed the Civic Forum. This is really important, the Civic Forum of the Velvet Revolution. A series of large demonstrations of up to 750,000 people forced Adamek to open talks with the Civic Forum. Adamek offered 5 out of 21 cabinet seats to non-communists, but this offer was soon dropped. On December 7th, Adamek resigned and non-communists formed a new government with a minority of communist members. On December 29th, the parliament elected Baklav Havel as president. Havel and the Civic Forum persuaded the USSR to withdraw its troops from the country while agreeing to remain part of the Warsaw Pact. The opening of the Berlin Wall and the Velvet Revolution provided the Romanians with an opportunity to oust their communist leader, Nicolae Sousou. His economic policies and the corruption he emanated caused significant opposition to emerge against him from within and without the government. The first revolts against the regime broke out in the largely ethnic Hungarian city of Timisoara, near the Hungarian border, and spread to Bucharest, Romania's capital, on December 21st. Once it became clear that the army had sided with the people against the Sos, secret police, he fled the capital. He was soon arrested by the army and executed with his wife on December 25th. All of this was Gorbachev approved. The National Salvation Front, or NSF, was formed on December 22nd by Silvio Brucan, a former ambassador to the U.S., who, ha who was under house arrest on the orders of César Su, General's Military, and Ayun Ilisiu. A, lead, a leading communist. After talks with opposition groups, the NSF established a Council for National Unity and held elections for a new government in May 1990. The, NFL, the NSF managed to win a majority in the elections and Ilisu was elected president. The success, the success of the NSF was an example of what Gorbachev hoped a reformed communist party could achieve. Romania remained a re reliable member of the Warsaw Pact until its dissolution in 1991. After the expulsion of Yugoslavia from Komin Form in 1948, it was more contact with the West and in the 1960s and 1970s allowed greater cultural and intellectual freedom than other communist states. However, Yugoslavia faced growing economic and political problems that were to destroy it by 1990. It was heavily dependent on foreign investment, and by 1988, inflation had reached almost 300% annually. The prestige of President Tito managed to keep ethnic rivalries in check, but after his death in 1980, leaders of the Yugoslav Federation increasingly used nationalism to strengthen their own political position. As people in Eastern Europe hoped for democracy, ethnic tensions increased in Yugoslavia. Influenced by events in Eastern Europe, the Communist Party's leading role in Yugoslavia was removed by the Federal Prime Minister Ante Markovic from the Constitution in January 1990, and multi-party federal elections were announced. These, however, only took place at state level beginning with the northern state of Slovenia in April 1990. Each election brought to power nationalists, and soon each Yugoslav state demanded, demanded independence, leading to the dismemberment of the country into newly independent rival states, and ultimately leading to war as well. Successively, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia, Kosovo, Smira, Gora, Gora also known as Montenegro, de declared their independence from Yugoslavia between 1991 and 2006. 
all but Macedonia and Tnia Gora fought the wars to achieve independence, with the most brutal being the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina between 1992 and 1995, in which 100,000 people were killed, millions displayed, displaced and most cities heavily destroyed. These events are majorly referred as the two Balkan Wars. Under Enver Hoxha, Albania ended relations with the USSR in 1961 and followed a strict Stalinist interpretation of communism. On Hoxha's death in 1985, Ramis Alia initially continued the same policies, but in February 1989 announced a limited reform based on Gorbachev's perestroika. Sessus's fall in Romania led to an anti-communist unrest and riots in the capital city of Tirana. This pushed the government into announcing further reform for fear of a larger revol revolt. The economy was partly centralized. A new electoral law was announced, allowing multi-candidate multi but not multi-party elections in 1991. At first, the Socialist Party of Albania won a majority of seats, but after a general strike, a multi-party government of national stability came into power, with the Democratic Party as a majority. Moving on to Germany, when free elections took place in 1989, only 16.4% of, of the votes went to the communists in, in the, the German Democratic Republic, while the pro-German Unity Party, the Christian Democratic Union, won 40.8% 40 of the vote. This effectively marked the end of communism in the GDR and made unification with the FRG more likely. This is going to be lead, leading to the Bonn Moscow Washington talks. FRG Chancellor Helmut Kohl could not reunify Germany without the agreement of the USSR, the US, and Germany's main Western European allies, Britain and France. In a series of negotiations in the summer of 1990, agreements on German unity was reached. The USSR was persuaded to agree to the reunification of Germany and Germans' membership into NATO by General loans which Gorbachev hoped would facilitate the modernization of the Soviet economy. Opposition in the West, particularly in Britain and France, was also overcome by calls and insistence on a united Germany, continued membership of NATO, and the European community. On September 12th, the 2 plus 4 treaty was signed in Moscow, it was in effect a peace treaty ending the partition of Germany as it terminated the residual rights of the former occupying powers in Germany and committed the new state to recognizing the other nays border with Poland. At midnight on October 2nd, 1990, the GDR was integrated into the FRG and a reunited Germany came into existence. After agreement on German reunification, the Cold War was effectively ended by decisions taken in Paris in November 1990. Representatives of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, which was dissolved in July 1991, met in Paris to sign the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe. It provided for the equal reduction of conventional weapons in both Eastern and Western Europe, agreed on a process of inspection and verification, and declared that the countries signing the pact were no longer adversaries. The participants of the conference also produced the Charter of Paris for a New Europe. This established a secretariat to organize annual meetings at, a, at head of government level for the creation of a conflict prevention center in Vienna to advise on conflict avoidance. Now for the fourth and last section of this presentation, the collapse of the USSR. Why was Gorbachev unable to prevent the disintegration of the USSR? Please take a screenshot of this presentation, uh, of this slide, because this is how this section of the presentation is structured. The collapse of the Soviet power in Eastern Europe in 1989 to 1990 and the disintegration of the USSR itself in 1991 came as a surprise to governments worldwide, including that of the Soviet Union. Here is a map of the successor states of the USSR. When it broke apart, this is what was left behind. The Cold War meant massive expenditures on armaments while also limiting trade and aid from the West. Large armies were maintained in Eastern Europe and Comic-Con economies were heavily subsidized between 1956 and the 1970s, again causing a massive drain on the economy. The USSR had limited access to many of the world's raw materials until the 1970s as a result of this war. 
Many ethnic groups, including the formerly independent Baltic states, wish to have either more or total independence. So Gorbachev is going to be initiating a, a series of reforms. They, he's going to be increasing investment in technology, restructuring the economy so that it was less centralized, this is known as perestroika, and giving workers greater freedom and incentives to encourage them to work harder. To win the support of the people for his reforms, Gorbachev realized that a policy of openness or glasnost had to be followed. Economic and political issues needed to be uh, debated openly. State censorship of the media was progressively eased and reception of foreign broadcasts was allowed. This ensured that the disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear power station in 1986 received major international publicity, as did Soviet failures in the Afghanistan war. Investigative journalism played a key role in exposing the corruption of the Communist Party elite. The party lost credibility. The years 1988 to 1989 were the high points of Glasnost. New political organizations were established, such as the Democratic Union, the First Opposition Party, and books by former dissidents were published. Religion, too, was tolerated. Churches, mosques, and synagogues were reopened, and for the first time in Soviet history, religious texts and books were openly on sale in the shops. There was also a sudden appearance of uncensored newspapers and journals. In May 1989, the USSR Congress of People's Deputies was elected in what were the first contested national elections organized by the Communists. Public debate was encouraged and the body was tasked with selecting the members for the new so Supreme Soviet. In February 1990, the cancellation of Article 6 of the old Soviet Constitution, which guaranteed the Communist Party a leading role in the USSR, destroyed the whole foundation on which the USSR's government existed. Party officials now had to have the backing of over 50% of the electorate to remain in office, and in the March elections, most long-term officials were rejected. Gorbachev was elected the first executive president of the USSR. By 1989, it was clear that Perestroika had not managed to resolve the country's economic difficulties. The USSR's budget revenue steadily declined while inflation rose. No goods were available whatsoever. The USSR was a federation of 15 republics in which the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic was by far the largest state. Perestroika, Glasnost, and the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe led to a reawakening of nationalism in many constituent republic states that were part of the USSR and felt dominated by ethnic Russians. This is why the nationality problem was so key in the collapse of the USSR. The Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, had been parts of the Russian Empire until the collapse of Russia in the First World War, when they gained temporary independence. They were observed by the Soviet Union in 1940, occupied by Germany from 1941 to 1944, and then again merged with the Soviet Union. Glasnost and Perestroika encouraged reformers and nationalists to press for independence. In 1988, so-called popular fronts, were coalition, which were coalitions of reformers, formed in all three republics. The Latvian People's Front demanded autonomy within the USSR. The Reform Movement of Lithuania announced its moral independence from the USSR. And the Estonian Popular Front issued a declaration of no confidence in the USSR. By 1990, all three declared independence. Initially, Gorbachev reacted strongly against the independence movement in the Baltic. He was determined to keep the USSR together, together at all costs. He imposed an economic blockade on Lithuania in April 1990, and in January 1991, Soviet troops entered all three Baltic states on the pretext of searching for military deserters. They attempted, attempted to take control of communications, but failed at the hands of protesters. Moving down in the, in the USSR, we're going to be seeing the, the location of Transcaucasia and the Central Asian Republic. Glasnost had also encouraged the emergence of historic ethnic conflicts in Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, as well as in the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. The most serious conflict occurred in the Southern Caucasus region and involved Christian Armenia and Muslim Azerbaijan. The Nagorno-Karabakh district, populated by Armenians, was claimed by Armenia, but had been granted to Azerbaijan by Stalin in 1923. It was divided from Armenia by a thin strip of land. 
Glasnost encouraged the Armenians to hold, their, to hold rallies during the winter of 1987 to 1988 and demanded its return. In February 1988, the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh um, was voted to merge with Armenia. Obviously, we have continued conflict, and so Gorbachev removed the leaders in both republics, but his failure to find a solution to the Nagorno-Karabakh issue led to growing nationalism in both Armenia and Azerbaijan. In early 1988, Leading Armenian intellectuals and nationalists formed the Karabakh Committee to lead an, or, and organize a campaign for the return of Karabakh to Armenia. In May 1989, the anti-communist Pan-Armenian nationalist movement was founded, aiming for Armenia's complete independence from the USSR. In June 1988, the Supreme Soviet in Armenia, contrary to Gorbachev's wishes, decided to support the demand for the return of Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia. In opposition to this, the Popular Front of Azerbaijan was formed in July 1988, which aimed at independence from the USSR and retention of Nagorno-Karabakh. We still see the conflict today into 2021. In July 1988, Nagorno-Karabakh was temporarily placed under the direct rule of the central government in Moscow. Both countries, however, still claimed the territory. The Azerbaijan Popular Front organized a rail blockade of Armenia, which led to shortages of petrol and food. It also had a, held a series of demonstrations in Baku, Azerbaijan's capital, which rapidly degenerated into riots against the local Armenians. At least 91 people were killed. On January 19th, the Azerbaijan Popular Front declared a state of emergency, and the following day, its members seized government and Communist Party buildings. Gorbachev responded by declaring martial law and sent Soviet troops to restore the government. Late at night, on January 19, 1990, 26,000 Soviet troops entered Baku, smashing through barricades established by Popular Front and attacking protesters, killing over 130 people. While the army gained control of Baku, it alienated Azerbaijan. Thousands of Communist Party members publicly burned their party cards. In Georgia, the independence movements in the Baltics and Traukaskasia inspired similar movements in the country. On April 1989, troops were sent onto the streets of Tbilisi, Georgia, after more than 100,000 people gathered in front of, of government offices and the Communist Party headquarters and called for Georgia's independence. So at the end of the day, all the states want independence because of these policies of Glasnost and Perestroika. In Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, Gorbachev's attempt to purge the local Communist Party organizations of corrupt officials triggered a nationalist backlash that ultimately resulted in both republics voting to leave the USSR. He basically replaced national leaders with Russian officials and all hell broke loose. In Belarus, Moldavia, and Ukraine, the demands for independence were strongest in those areas which had been annexed by the Soviet Union by, between 1939 and 1940. The democratic movement of Moldova was created in 1988 to campaign initially for greater cultural independence from the USSR. In May 1989, inspired by events in the Baltic and the Popular Front of Moldavia, uh, was founded. It was successfully persuaded the Moldavian Supreme Soviet to adopt a new language law on August 31st, 1989, which made Moldavian the official state language. In March 1990, it became the largest party in the elections for the Supreme Soviet. The key to the future of the USSR in, in, was Ukraine, its second largest republic. If Ukraine chose independence, the USSR would be doomed. Initially, local communist authorities attempted to end demonstrations, but that became much more difficult when the Republic-wide Ukrainian Popular Front Movement, also known as RUK, was created in 1989. In October 1990, RUK declared that its principal goal was no longer autonomy within the USSR, but complete independence. In Belarus, the Belarus Popular Front was established in 1988 as both a political party and a cultural movement, demanding democracy and independence for Belarus. The discovery of mass graves in woods outside of Minsk, the capital, of those executed by the Soviet government added momentum to the pro-democracy and pro-independence movement in the republic. 
Elections took place to the Russian Revo uh, Federation Congress of People's Deputies in March and April 1990 and gave a majority to reformers. Gorbachev's rival, Boris Yeltsin, emerged as a leading politician in Russia and was elected chairman of the Congress. On June 12, the Congress declared that Russia was a sovereign state and that its laws took precedence over those made by the overall union, the USSR. The term sovereign asserted the moral right of the republic to self-determination. That summer was a summer of sovereignty. Elections also took place in the other republics during March and April 1990 for all the Republic's Supreme Soviets. All followed Ros Russia's examples in declaring sovereignty. The exception was Latvia, which had already claimed to be independent. These declarations of independence prompted Gorbachev to create a draft of the new Union Treaty in November 1990. In March 1991, a referendum was held on the question of creating a new, a new union formed by the reformer members of the USSR. Soviet citizens were asked whether they supported the creation of a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics. The referendum was boycotted by the Baltic republics, Moldavia, Georgia, and Armenia, but in the other republics it was supported by 74% of voters. Gorbachev faced opposition from two quarters communists in the army party and the KGB, and reformers led by Boris Jeltsin, who in June 1991 became the first directly elected president of Russia. On August 18th, just two days before the Union Treaty was to come into effect, leading communists launched an abortive coup in Moscow while Gorbachev was on holiday. There was no public backing for the rebels and the coup collapsed. Yeltsin played a key role in rallying the crowds in Moscow against the coup and was able to emerge as the savior of new Russia. The once all-powerful Communist Party was made illegal in Russia in August. What are the consequences of this? The nine republics that had agreed to the Union Treaty now refused to implement it. Gorbachev attempted to draft a new treaty, but this was too rejected by all the republics. The final blow to the USSR came when the Ukraine decided on complete independence from the USSR after holding a referendum in December 1991. The Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus established the Commonwealth of Independent States, also known as CIS, which was then joined on December 21, 1991 by eight additional former Soviet republics, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Georgia joined two years later in December 1993. On December 25th, 1991, Gorbachev resigned. On December 31st, 1991, the USSR ceased to exist. We thank David Williamson for his book on the Cold War, and we recognize the authors of all visual and auditory content in this presentation. Thank you.